Let's be real. Starting, running, and scaling a coaching business can feel exhausting. I mean, you've got the marketing, the hustling, the selling, all that stuff you didn't realize you would need to master when you decided to start a coaching business. For anything like me, you started your coaching business to change the world, to improve the lives of others while improving your own. Well, the truth is, Running a business doesn't have to be as hard as many of us have made it out to seem. And you don't even have to do all that hustling stuff if you don't want to. You really can get into flow, into your zone of genius, and get back to the work you were sent here to do. But you have to ask for help. You have to be willing to work in new ways. You have to be willing to open up your mind to mentors who might be doing it differently than you've ever considered. And you have to be willing to actually implement new ways of thinking and running your business. If you're up for that, stay tuned. I'm Hannah Hermanson, your certified coach, international speaker, author, and yes, the founder of Dream Life is Real Life and the host of the show. And I've been able to help hundreds of coaches build, scale, and enjoy their online businesses. Essentially, make their dream life their real life. And if you'd like help improving your business life and get your coaching business to the next level, we might be able to help you. Head on over to dreamlifeisreallife.com slash show to get all the resources and episodes that we talk about in this community. You can join our Facebook community. You can find me on Instagram. But more importantly, if you're really ready to integrate what you learn here today and on other episodes, then you'll be able to set up a complimentary 10-minute chat with my team. Again, at dreamlifeisreallife.com slash show, no strings attached. We love getting to know you and seeing what are the right next moves for you. But now let's get on to the show. In this podcast, you'll find the real people, concrete tactics, and weekly motivation and inspiration to make your dream life and business real. I started this podcast to bring you the role models that I never had. We talk to successful entrepreneurs, freedom seekers, business owners, and people living life on their own terms. To be a true leader, to create the legacy you desire, and to live in alignment, you need a tribe lifting you up. And I've made it my mission to be your tribe, to bring them to your ears at least, Because after all, we are all in this together. Now, let's cue the music. All right. Welcome back, everyone. It is Hannah. And today we get to hang out with my friend and co-author, Paula Harris. Yes, um, we recently participated in a co-authored book called Life Life Lessons in Success. There it is in real life, um, which we can chat about a little bit more. But today I'm excited to bring Paula to you all to the show um, because she's got so much more than just one chapter of a book (laughs) Um, and is going to talk to us a little bit about her expertise when it comes to um, financial planning and setting yourself up for financial success. Uh, Because it's not often you meet a financial advisor who is an accomplished cheesemaker, yogi, local hero, and Wonder Woman. Um, But those are just some of the many reasons why Paula is not like everyone else. She is the co-founder of Cornerstone Investments, And she's a part financial advisor and part dream architect who takes great pride in helping her clients, particularly midlife widowed women, um, to help them obtain financial peace of mind while they get back on their feet and rise back up and navigate their path forward. Paula is assisting people in the life planning that goes hand in hand with financial planning. Um, we are She is a return on life advisor as well as a certified Jack Canfield trainer with um, you know what we talk about a lot here, Jack's uh, success principles. She's also the founder of Rise Up Success Training and has several Rise Up Weekend Retreats for Women in Transition. She also has a YouTube channel called Wind... <laughs> Wisdom Wednesday, and she shares her ponderings, positivity, and prayer there, as well as here today. So welcome, Paula. Thank you, Hannah. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Your energy is so awesome. Right? Yep, absolutely. We, um, I always love to remind people, especially after 
12 months of quarantine that we have met in real life. Paula and I have like hugged and uh, participated in the activities and coaching in the same room. And so I'm really excited to bring some of your um, great energy to the show. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With all of your accomplishments, you know, you've got certifications, you've launched many businesses, you've founded and co-founded all sorts of things. I'm curious, what has, has brought you here? You've always been sort of entrepreneurial in spirit or what started you in the, uh, the business world? Uh, you know, it's funny when you, I hadn't thought about this, but when you said uh, entrepreneurial and what started me in the business world, I think back, like I, I had a paper route. Um, for the Boston Globe when I was a kid, like when I was like 11. I mean, so that was like probably my first, you know, you had to go my first job and I had to go find customers. And I actually won a trip to Florida uh, when I was in sixth grade that my parents let me go on without their chaperoning. Um, so I guess from an early age, I've been like doing my own thing. So that's kind of cool. Blazing a trail, a paper yeah. trail. <laughs> Absolutely. And now I, you know, my husband and I, um, my husband, Bill, we work together in the company that we have that we founded uh, back in the late 1990s. And so it's been a while that we've been on our own. And once you go on your own, it's really hard to go back. It is. It is. And, you know, the work that you do, you know, between dream life architecturing and financial advising, when did that come together for you? What did you start out just in financial or just in life coaching? I'm really curious how this came together. So my life before I came to um, our financial planning firm, I was a college recruiter. So I recruited highly competitive students out of the, the um, like the Harvards and the MITs to come work for consulting firms and for uh, financial firms and helping people uh, like align where they want to go. Like they've set big goals and they want to get there. So that sort of started that then coming in, marrying in the, the financial planning world, I mean, money is just a tool in our lives. It's a very important tool. It's a, it's, it's a way we measure how we're doing success-wise. It's a way that we um, exchange our knowledge for, you know, for to pass it to someone else and they reward us for that. Uh, so people come to us, like want help with money, but so much of it more is about their life. Like I actually, this afternoon, I'm going to be meeting with a couple and they're in their mid fifties and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, can we retire early? So we're going to go through and look at like, okay, how's your wheel of life? Like what areas aren't working? What areas are working? Um, We're going to do the personal values assessment. And we're going to have a discussion about like, what's most important to you and how can we try to realign your life around that. So I'm not a full like life coach, but I, I know enough to play one on TV as they would say (laughs) dangerous. Yeah. But but really help people like ask good questions to help them to think differently. Cause we get, we just tend to, I say, we follow the dream. We go, we go to school, we graduate from high school. Most of us go to college, we get married, we get, you know, we get a job, we get married. And then we go, what the heck am I doing? Like they, we never think about what's in our heart. And what we really want to be doing, we often live our lives for someone else. I mean, you yeah. you, that's what you talk about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, I don't know if you knew I used to be a college advisor. And it was that ah. same energy of like young people setting big goals. Let's figure out how to do it. But here are 50 options you can pick from and yep. give it the college try. And you'll end up with the path that you just outlined, right? Yeah. Of, just kind of following what's laid out in front of you instead of really getting clear on what it is you want. And so many of the people that I talk to have these big goals. They're go-getters. They have clear aspirations and they'll say things like, I want to earn a million dollars or I want to retire early, but they don't actually know how to do that or what that actually means for them. Okay. So it was really interesting for me because in one of the conferences we were at about two and a half, three years ago with Jack, I put out the goal. I'm going to have, you know, a $500,000 year. And I just said that to say that. And when I sat down with uh, the numbers and like figured out what that would mean for my business, I was like, no, I do not want to work like that. I do not want to charge that much. I do not want to have that many clients. I don't actually want that life, yeah. but I had that goal number, right? And I'm wondering if that's something that you see as well, that maybe people 
aren't aligned with the right goals when it comes to that. Absolutely true. I think we, we sort of succumb to uh, peer pressure, society pressure, you know, what we're expected to do. I mean, we're expected to just, of course, you're going to make a lot of money. That's what you should do. That's the American dream. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like you said, when you realize the trade-offs to making that, like, whoa, maybe I don't want it. Um, that may be a little bit more than I want to bite off. And and I think more people to wake up to that and understand it makes more sense. So like, you know, we always say that, like running the numbers, the numbers never lie. Um, the, the numbers tell a story. And are you willing to listen to that? What story they're telling? Are you going to try to massage it to look different? And that's a, you know, that's yeah. a big issue for people. Yeah. And I used to be afraid of the numbers, right? Like, oh, I just want to, you know, I know I'm not, I know I'm not there yet. So I, I wouldn't like pay attention to it. I would just work more. Right. And, and that was my realization that was like, man, if I, if I'm just like chasing this dangling carrot, but I'm not really even grounding it in the numbers, um, what is it for? Right. And so I love to dive into this a little bit as to how how we can get clear on what our financial goals should be, because I think that is a clear first step. Yep. Uh, so then, then we can reverse engineer or set a, an action plan in motion. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the first things you have to think about is um, what do you need to live on? You know, how much money do you need? And a lot of times, like I live up in Massachusetts in a you know, Massachusetts is, an, and, and I live on the coast of Massachusetts. Right now I'm, I'm living a, a workcation on Nantucket, which is a lot of fun. Um, that's my, my sort of COVID fun. Um, but it's expensive, very expensive. So that's a trade-off. If I want to do that, I'm gonna have to make more money. If I want to live maybe like in Florida, it costs less money. You know, you, you, you move from California. I'm guessing where you're living now is less money. So it's like, you have to be willing to make those trade-offs. So first you have to figure out, okay, what it is, what are your non-negotiables? Like we all need a roof over our head. So uh, how big does that roof need to be? How many bedrooms, you know, how many amenities, you know, does it have to have central air? Does it, you know, like what are the, how many bathrooms? Okay. The more of all that, it's going to cost more, which means your overhead's more, you're going to earn more. So, and then it goes back to things like, okay, how do you want to eat? We talk about a 50, 30, 20 budget. 50% of the money you have should be spent on the things you must have. That's the roof over your head, clothing on your back, food in your belly, insurances to keep you safe, um, some form of transportation that could be literally you have a car or could be the bus pass. Um, So it depends. So that's the 50%. And the 30% is the nice to haves. Okay, I want to go out to eat. I want to eat filet mignon rather than uh, portobello steaks. You know, I want to have... nicer clothes. I want to have, you know, I want a Tesla versus, you know, four wheels or, I'm, you know, so those are those trade-offs, you know, I want to do more than like my one week at the shore for vacation. You know, I want to go to Europe for a month. So that's the next level. And then 20% should go to savings. Mm-hmm. You should be making sure, I mean, you got to save, you know, you ideally you're paying yourself first. You're taking that 20% off the top and you're saving it either through a retirement program. If you're working for an employer, you're going to put it in there. If you are working for yourself, you know, as long as you've got the earned income, you fund your IRA. Um, and then you got to, to fund all of your, um, you know, your financial cushion. So ideally, especially if you want to be some type of self-employed, you want six months of expenses in the bank. You know, I was reading one of the stories um, in our book, Life Lessons and Success, Angie's, and her story was like, she got to the point where she got to, like, she didn't have enough money to cover the next month's mortgage payment. She had gone through her cash reserves. She had to hustle it to get her butt in gear to get work done, and she made it happen. So you got to, like, have that discipline to stick to, like, what the budget is. So that's sort of the 50, 30, 20 in broad strokes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for how you want to live your life. And then you've got to negotiate with yourself. Oh, so much in there. So much in there. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to stay on the tactics, but I do just have to mention, or like, I want to double down on this values work piece that you alluded to, because it's always interesting to me when people tell me that they love travel 
And if they, in their dream life, they're doing all this travel or going all these wonderful places, but then their actions don't actually align with that, right? They spend money on having a really big house or lots of cars or what I call toys, because those aren't like values of mine. I would rather, you know, create experiences. And so I'm curious, you know, for people, because I know this is so common right now with social media and being quarantined in our boxes, that it's really easy to look and say that you think you want what everyone else wants, right? So any tips on like actually getting clear on your values and being able to actually articulate what my goals are, what I want my dream life to look like, as opposed to still what everyone else is telling me or what I should be doing because I'm going to be 30 soon. And that means life's about to get real as someone recently told me (laughs) one of the first things i always say to people is shut turn off the news like do not watch the news do not let outside media influences shape you so like you got to start to know who you are and then you've got to limit your social media you got to you know i'm sure this has been talked about a million times here but everybody's putting forward their best foot on social media. They don't put forward like the, the really crappy days. So you got to know right away that, that they're not real. So, you know, we talk, I talk a lot about the Joneses. People try to keep up with the Joneses. They are what I call shredded weeders often. So beautiful house. They got the, the name brand car in the driveway, but you look in the windows and there's no furniture and they eat shredded wheat for dinner because they can't afford anything else. But you look from the outside going, they have it all. Well, frankly, most people don't have it all. They don't have it figured out. And so you got to like figure out what makes you happy. And it's really, it's not easy to live an authentic life and to reflect back for you. But I find my first thing is limit the outside exposure so that you then get in touch with yourself. And then think about what makes you happy. I mean, I'll often say to people like, you know, you want to make these trade-offs, but you know, you got to fund retirement. Do you want to eat cat food in retirement? Are all those filet mignon dinners worth it today to eat cat food later? And it's a little dramatic, but sometimes it wakes people up because it's like, you, you know, you have to plan for both. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. One of my mentors once laid this out, like putting a train together in that many of us, especially listening to this show, or even just being entrepreneurs, our dreamer train car is like off the rails. And for me, it had to do that. I had to stretch myself and get out of my comfort zone and build some of that fire under me, like Angie did to like make it work. Right. And that dreamer train can go off the rails to then when you, you aren't prepared for um, financial necessities. Right. So my mentor was talking about connecting your dreamer train with the pragmatist. In that as much as you love the law of attraction and only thinking good thoughts and, you know, not saving for a rainy day because that's negative. But like there are certain things you need to connect your dreamer train to to make sure that it's sustainable, that you can come from a place of stability, even though I know entrepreneurs don't think they like that. (laughs) But like you're saying, there are some basic needs that you need to make sure you've got sorted out. Right. Like that that rainy day. I mean. Unfortunately, a rainy day is going to come in everyone's life. Um, and we call it curveball life planning. The curveball comes out of nowhere when you least expect it. I mean, I got a call this morning from um, one of my high school friends, and she said, I'm so sorry to tell you that my mom died two days ago. She said she just collapsed, had a massive stroke, and she died. And I'm calling you because she, I found the Valentine's Day card that you sent her in the pocketbook. Um, so, like, you don't know when it's going to happen. And maybe, yeah, she was older, but you know, 30 year olds, things happen, you know, a life illness, um, a major tragedy, like you got to have that money in the bank. And I don't, I I believe in the law of attraction, but there's also, you've got to do your work to meet it. And that's where I think too many people think, like you said, just happy thoughts. No, you got to have those. You don't have the negative, but you prepare. It's the pragmatist. Yes. You prepare for that rainy day. You put that 20% in savings. So then you know, I use this example too. And I was in um, college, I went to Providence College and we were fortunate. The basketball team went to the uh, final four while I was there. And because I chose not to go out every Saturday night and party my money that I saved, I was able to go to the Sweet 16 and to New Orleans for the final four because I had money in the bank. So I kind of, I got to take advantage of those experiences rather than like, oh yay, more pizza and beer. Like what, you know, that for me was more important. 
Yeah. And money really does show your values. Right. Yes. And I think that that really highlights, you know, what what you decided to use that energy for, because money is just another form of energy. And so just like, you know, you don't want to spend all of your energy out partying. You don't want to spend your, your, your money in that way either. So right. I'm hearing the save 20 percent. And I'm also hearing pay yourself first. What Absolutely. does that look like in practice? So that means. All right. Let's say you get a two thousand dollar check. You know, you're paid for your services. Twenty percent of that goes into a bank account immediately. It's not you don't do it at the end of the month when you've paid all your other bills. It's pay yourself first. It comes off the top, and then from there, you know, you got to figure out. A lot of folks, you know, they're working for themselves. You got to pay your taxes, so you're going to have to put money into a. a a fund a bank account for taxes separate from your savings. Because if we see a bucket of money, we think it's all fungible. So that's why I, I'm a big believer in having sort of multiple bank accounts. You know, you, you, you have your retirement account, you have your taxes account, you have your saving, and then you have your operating capital, like, you know, your checking account or something on those lines, but you got to take it out of your view because if we see it, we're human. We, you know, we think we have more than we have. Um, which is a big deal. So that's part of the pay yourself first is make sure that everything comes in and you take it off right away. Yeah. Yeah. This is sounding, are you familiar with the profit first book? I have not read that. Mike, I'm going to butcher his, a very Mikulowski kind of last name. (laughs) Um, And he recommends having like five bank accounts and like, um, you know, multiple times a month sitting down and siphoning these things out. Um, You know, I think the old school way was like the, the The envelope. Yeah. Having envelopes so that you just don't, you use what you have. Right. Right. And And if if you get to the end of your pay cycle, whatever that may mean, and you have no more money left in the fun category or the go out to eat category, you don't do it. That's where I think credit cards have been a wonderful thing, but I think they've also given us a false sense of like, I can do it all. And, yeah. yeah. And, you know, unless you're paying that credit card off every month, you should not be, you know, charging a dinner that you're going to pay off for the next five years. Like that meal just became super, super expensive. And you don't even remember what you ordered. <laughs> So that's like, that's a big deal. And, you know, the other thing is like instant Amazon, everything can be shipped to you. So we just order and order and apps. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. But one other thing, you know, if people are thinking about making that leap, like they're in a, like a career right now, the thing I would also say is you want to make sure you've got your finances buttoned up in in the sense that um, we've seen this a lot credit cards. If you're in a relationship and the, and the credit card is not in your name, you got to make sure that you have credit in your name. Like we had a widow recently in her late fifties, her husband passed away. She didn't have a credit card in her name because even if your name's on it, you may not be primary. She got a $350 credit limit on a card that she applied for herself. So think about this. She goes to the gas station and that credit card, she buys $50 worth of gas. The gas station puts $150 hold on the account and she doesn't even have enough money left to go buy groceries on the credit card. So you want to make sure you have your own credit card. You also want to think about if you are, you know, thinking about making a move, but you're going to need a car soon. Like while you have steady income, like you button up your financial life. If you're you know, applying for a mortgage, you have to do that before you, you know, don't have income, a, a, an auto loan. Um, if you ha- already have a house, your home equity line, like get that stuff in place because otherwise you won't, you don't have a steady income. You're not going to be able to get credit. It's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I am kind of la- I don't even know. I'm beside myself because five yep. years ago, Paula, none of this crossed my mind. I was so on the dreamer train. Right. Yep. And so I'm curious, you know, where, where do you, cause I know you're into, you know, taking risks, feeling the fear, like going after your dreams. So where could, I don't even know how to ask this question. Like, I don't recommend just quitting your job and moving to San Francisco and saying, I'll figure it out. Like I did, but it really worked out for me. <laughs> and I'm really glad that I didn't, you know, like hesitate or wait until I had a car or wait until I had these other certain things. So, you know, in that life architect type of side of this, I'm really curious, you know, 
what you would recommend to someone who might not have all of their ducks in a row, but is ready to make a leap, who is ready to make a change, like, is that self-sabotage or could it, you know, fuel people to, to get closer to some of their dreams? So by nature, I've always been a planner. I always have yeah. like my escape route. Like I just, I naturally assess when I go into any sort of situation, like, okay, what can I do? And and I, as much as I'm a risk taker, I, I'm a cautious risk taker. I, I've assessed my situation. So I would say, okay, what's the worst that can happen? So I'm guessing when you moved to San Francisco, the worst that could happen was you moved home with your parents. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's like, okay, if that's the worst that can happen, all right, that's great. Or what if you had no one and you had no one to fall back on? Maybe you have to be more cautious or, but if you know that there's going to be a roof over your head somewhere, you go do it. I think you also have to know that you have some skills. Like you either, you can either talk yourself into anything, uh, talk your way into anything. You know, you, you're, I, we, my husband and I would joke, you know, we started this business. Um, I had a corporate career and he started out uh, and it was not making money for like three years. And he kept saying, should I go get a job? And I was like, no, because we, we always said, if we could say, would you like fries with that shake? We could do anything. So like, I would like, you know, it's the sort of the starving artist. Yes, I love that. It's all, there's always a way to make money. Yeah. The waitress, the bartender, the yeah. babysit, like whatever it is, know that you might have to do that in pursuit of your goals or that you truly are willing to do it. Like I am, I, nothing is beneath me. Like I volunteer, you know, uh, for something. I mean, I have literally been the person the next day after the big party tent comes down and I'm picking up the cigarette butts, like nothing is beneath me. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think things are too beneath you, you're going to hurt yourself because yeah. you're going to limit what you're willing to do. Therefore, you know, to make money that you're going to then limit your upward growth too. Yeah. So it's like, okay, know that what are your fallback plans? Yeah. You know, I will not go home. Like <laughs> one of my friends, her two sons are trying to make it in LA in the music business. One um, brother is living in the closet, like a, with a twin mattress of the other brother. Uh, but their dream is that strong that they're willing to make that trade off. But if you think you're going to have the Beverly Hills fancy house right away, that's not realistic. So you have to put some realism in the pragmatic get on that pragmatist train. Yes, yes, yes. I always ask folks when they're on that, you know, take the leap thing. And this is why I wanted you to be here because I do know there's like financial planning that can go into these decisions. However, I often ask the question, will you, are you fight or flight? Yep. When you're under pressure, do you perform and figure out next week's mortgage, next month's mortgage and use that as motivation and fuel? Or do you freeze? and sink into anxiety and stop taking action. Yep. I happen to be the type that like you, I will keep taking actions. If I'm opening the gym at 4 30 AM and working yep. as an assistant and scooping ice cream, all things that I've done because the dream is so big. And I think there's a huge element of self-awareness in addition to planning for, you know, best or worst outcomes. Right. That right. Goes to this decision. Right. And I think your, your example of fight or flight is, is just perfect. I mean, if you're going to um, freeze up and not make anything happen, you maybe don't take the leap because you, you might get too hurt because you just can't make it happen. Or you do do it with someone who you know is going to pull the best out of you and make you move. Yeah. But if left to your own devices, if you're not going to do it, that's tough. Um, so it's like, I, you know, also you can live the dream life you know, in, in a, you don't always have to be an entrepreneur. You don't always have to like chuck it all and run away and do it. How do you live that dream life within the confines of what you have? So some, I think sometimes it's like people think it's all or nothing and it doesn't need to be like, okay, well, how do you make some steps? You know, how do you go do something? I mean, I, we, we first got to Nantucket, I, there was a waiter and I was like, so how long have you been on the island? He goes three days. I was going to, I'm, I'm a student at some school in New York city. And he said, it was just too hard to stay there. So my parents and I moved out here. I'm doing my classes online and I'm working on Nantucket. I'm like, okay. He took advantage of it. Like still yeah. a student, yeah. but like, okay, how do you make, how do you figure it out? And this is, this is back to self-awareness, right? Um, Cause I think there is a lot to be said for figuring out like what that dream life is and like going back to like what it is you actually want. So yeah. a question that I had for a while was 
do I really need to be an entrepreneur or is this an ego thing? Like, am I just being an entrepreneur because I said I would, yep. right? And I'm just going to go, you know, that all or nothing mentality. And I have this vision of what my Instagram has to look like. So I'm just going to like keep doing it. Well, over the last couple of years, I've tried on jobs, like working as a coach in other places and doing copywriting. And like, I've tried on all of these things um, that keep bringing me back. And I yep. think when you have that willingness to experiment and to get clarity on what it is you actually want, um, those are the things worth going, you know, taking a leap for, I guess is what I'm. But, but you also, you did it from, from knowledge. You know, you didn't just do it like you went and I, I tested it. Okay. Yeah, this works. Nope. This doesn't work. And that gets you closer to getting to your dream life because you now know you're, you're honing in more and more what makes sense as opposed to just like pie in the sky. I think I will try. And like, you, you have no idea, but you yeah. tested it along yeah. the way. But this, this is um, from experience because the first year of my business, when I was just throwing spaghetti onto the fridge, quitting my jobs, putting stuff out there, opening the, just throwing spaghetti to the fridge, literally to see what stuck. Yep. I, I wasn't coming from that place of responsibility. I was coming from scarcity. I have to make this work, keep going, keep going. And now that I've done enough work with like life lessons and success and the success principles, and I know that I have a hundred percent responsibility and that everything that's happening is happening for me. And yeah. I get to use as like this life experience experiment, as opposed to um, things are coming at me or I have to force or I have to make, make something work in a certain way. Um, so I'm not so like, I was not meaning to plug the book, but I really think the book is like a great way to help people get clarity and start to plan for their dream life. Really. That is, that yeah. is true. That is true. And you just said something I didn't, I learned it, you know, probably seven years ago, everything in your life happens for you, not to you. And if you see it as a gift, it changes your life entirely. So you could be that victim. Oh, this bad thing happened. This bad thing happened. It's like, or you get ahead and you go, oh, this is why this happened. I'm going to zig instead of zag. That was life altering, learning that. And I have found that as I've turned on the light for my finances, like I said, I just ignored money. I was like, I'm going to be a millionaire or whatever. <laughs> um, I wasn't like being on the pragmatist train yet. Nope. But since I've been on the pragmatist train and I have savings and I know where money is or whatever, that stuff doesn't scare me as much like the, the random phone call or the zigzag because I'm prepared with, you know, the rainy day fund, but yep. also my skills, like you said, in that, um, you know, we really can weather any storm when we have the mindset and some money, you know, energy of that, you know, um, safety net, if you yeah. will. But uh, you just said uh, skills. It's important to keep investing back in your skills. So like, you know, we met at a course that was, you know, it was not an inexpensive course, but, it, you know, because of the fee, I committed to it even more. Um, but also sometimes you have to know, and there's a woman we both know, and she's in one of my mastermind groups. And I had, we had to have the conversation, like enough courses, you have enough knowledge, just go do it. And she you know, she took that butt kicking and she is making stuff happen. And like having confidence in yourself, I think is a big deal and knowing that it's advancing. Uh, but like you said, you know, when you start to focus and I don't think focusing money is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think you can over-focus and make it an obsession, but being aware, like you look at your bank account, you, you look and see what's there. You plan out, you know, okay, I can do the following things. And if this happens, I can even do this thing. But just blindly ignoring it or bl just saying like, la, 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 I'm going to make it happen. Like yeah, manifesting it. Yep. I but that, there's our that manifesting yeah. is great, but you, you, you took a course to do it. You like, you furthered your skills. You went out and met people that could help you. You, know, you right. just can't sit right. in a, your little room and manifest things. You got to put yourself out there. And you know, all right, so people are going to say, oh, okay, it's COVID. I can't do anything. BS. I mean, look at your own life. You just up and moved in the middle of COVID. I, I've gone and done something big in COVID. I have met so many great people online. Um, I'm meeting people on Clubhouse. Like I'm meeting people like all different places. Like you can still meet people. You can still make connections to make things happen. Yeah, make stuff happen. I do want to um, kind of enter one final topic with you, which you're, yep. you're raising now. And that's, 
investing in your knowledge, investing in yourself, investing in your health, investing in your business. What does a financial planner say to making those decisions? When is the right time? What do you need to have in place? I'm going to say yesterday is always the right time. So if that wasn't yesterday, it's today. So when we talk about, you know, this is going to go to the end, like to retirement for a second, but we see the biggest expense in, in retirement is going to be your health ready to, to, to your money. That is going to take the most of your money. And so you've got to be prepared for that. So today you've got to make better choices around what you eat, how much you exercise, you know, what, what you put into your body. So I'm a big, I mean, I go to the chiropractor frequently because she helps adjust my, me mentally, physically, spiritually. Um, I'm working really hard to eat foods that don't inflame me to like, to do all those things because I don't want to spend all my hard earned money on like taking care of my poor declining health later. So yes, invest in yourself now. I think you could go a little crazy. You know, you don't need to have every Lululemon outfit in order to go to yoga. You know, I remember going to a yoga class once and the woman said, I remember when we did yoga just on the floor without mats, like we can keep it simple. Like we don't need to have all the props and, and, uh, accoutrements that go with every hobby that we have. So I do think uh, always be er learning to earn more. So whatever that means, you know, whether you take, you know, I'm, I'm uh, signed up for Mind Valley. I'm taking a course in speed reading right now so that I can like read quicker so I can learn more. So that, like, that's a good foundational investment in my skills, like figure out what keeps you earning and growing. Like I, I listen to clubhouse when people talk about, like, I want to give a Ted talk. So I invested in taking a course on how to give a TEDx talk. Uh, so again, yes, keep investing along the way. Don't overinvest in it. Trust yourself, trust your knowledge at some point, but keep adding to it. Um, and yeah. And again, your physical health and your, your mental health, you, you got to take the time and really invest in them. Yeah. I mean, there, I see these things of, you can either pay, like pay for it now by making those decisions, making those investments or pay for it later. Um, and it will be way more expensive and painful. <laughs> yeah. And painful. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, this was so helpful. I think, you know, my big takeaways and the baby step or that next right thing that we can start doing is uh, paying ourselves first, taking 20% into savings and just taking a look at where our money is, but not over obsessing. So can yep. you break down the 50, 30, 20? Again, sure. folks can maybe start organizing and hiding yep. what they need to. <laughs> so again, 50% of the money that you have coming in should be spent on your overhead, the things that keep you on this earth and keep you safe. So that's going to be a roof over your head, some form of transportation, clothing on your back, food in your belly, insurances, you know, health insurance, if, you know, car insurance or whatever that goes with the life that you have, um, the, the, all the responsible things you need to do, paying your taxes. Um, and then the 30% is the nice to have. So that's where the fun comes in. That's where you get to like, okay, do you want just to have the yoga outfit or you want to have the Lululemon yoga outfit? So, you know, you, you can play around. You want to eat street food or you want to go to a five-star restaurant or you still want to eat at home. Like you, these are the types of decisions you get to make. And, they, and again, they're trade-offs. The more you eat at the five-star restaurant means you can't do a lot of other things. That's a, a choice you're making. I, you know, again, type of car you drive, all that. I, I think of a car more as four wheels. Like it's not a status symbol for me, but for a lot of people it is. And then that 20% is your savings. That's your savings for the rainy day fund, the retirement, uh, for every day, you know, for the travel, like, you know, well, not for travel, but for like the, the things for the future. So that's how the 50, 30, 20 breaks down. So good. So actionable. I love it. And good. I love how clearly that that can help people, you know, accelerate their path to dream life, right? Yep. Yeah, and I think. Yeah, the biggest thing is being aware. No, take the head out of the sand and be aware. Maybe keep your toes in the sand. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Feet on the ground and the toes in the sand. <laughs> I had my fear. I actually here in Massachusetts had my feet in the sand and the water last Sunday, mm -hmm. um, which for March is kind of unheard of, but it felt great. Yes, I love that. Well, Paula, how can folks continue this conversation with you and learn more about the work you do? Sure. My uh, company website is whcornerstone.com. 
Um, I'm on most social media channels, you know, from Clubhouse to Twitter to Instagram, um, Facebook and LinkedIn. And um, I also do this fun new project called Wisdom Wednesday on YouTube, where I just, you know, I want to bring positivity to the world. So I just talk about some things that I've been reflecting on. And it's been really fun. You're doing it. I so appreciate you. And always, you know, pick up our book, Life Lessons and Success, right? (laughs) Thank you so much, dear uh, friends. I will be back next week with another inspiring guest that will help you make your dream life your real life. That's right, friends. That'll do it for our show today. But remember, if you're really ready to implement and take these ideas into action, then hop on over to dreamlifeisreallife.com slash show. And you can access all of the resources we talked about. And more importantly, set up a complimentary 10 minute phone call with my team so that we can help you get clarity and some concrete action steps in place. So this doesn't just become another one of those feel good moments but an opportunity to actually make a change in your life and business because all good things come in action. So we'll see you over there at dreamlifeisreallife.com slash show and next week here on the show.